All right, let's get started. Okay, I want to welcome you all to our exciting webinar event with our next guest. And, um, and we at the CGMA are very lucky to have him. Uh, his concept, costume, illustrations, and designs have helped adorn some of the most uh, high profile actors starring in some of the biggest event movies in the last 10 years. Uh, listen to this list of credits. It's crazy, but it's amazing. And at uh, Marvel Entertainment alone, he's worked on Captain America, the first Avenger, uh, Avengers Infinity War, Black Panther, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., X-Men Days of Future Past, and Dark Phoenix. And if that weren't enough, because that could be right, at, right there, that would be enough. If that weren't enough, he's also done costume concepts for The Greatest Showman. By the way, that's my favorite, uh, my wife's favorite musical to date. Um, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Uh, Star Trek In the Darkness, pretty amazing film. Uh, Star Trek Beyond, Inception, Hunger Games, uh, DC's Man of Steel, Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol, and A Wrinkle in Time. You even work for Oprah. Holy smokes, man. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say, with over 12 years of experience in the feature film business, let's give a hearty, warm welcome to Phil Boutte Jr. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. I All right. So uh, before we get started, uh, by the way, how are you doing, Phil? I'm doing great. It's a good day. <laughs> All right. This is great. We're excited to have you. Uh, before we get started, guys, I just want to kind of thank our sponsor, CG Master Academy, for hosting this webinar. Uh, CG Master Academy is the leader in online digital arts education and film, animation, and games, and we're thankful for their generous sponsorship. Um, just want to give you guys a note on the uh, attendee side. Uh, we want to make sure that if you have any potential questions, that you guys take advantage of the Q&A button uh, that we have here. So there's a Q&A window. And uh, this is the window that we're going to be looking for any questions that you have for Phil uh, for the webinar. So I will try to work them in throughout the webinar where it makes sense. And we'll leave about maybe five minutes towards the end uh, for Phil to get started. So um, to, to answer any questions that we didn't get to during the webinar. Uh, besides that, that's about it. So the chat is just for chat, but if you have questions, I'm gonna be looking for them here. So now I'm gonna give over the reins to Phil Boutte Jr. And he's gonna share a little bit what it's like to be a costume concept designer, illustrator, uh, partner. So I'm gonna go ahead, stop the share. You guys uh, will have Phil now. Okay. Um, thank you guys very much for coming and also to thank you to CGMA um, for hosting me. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and also thank you guys for just kind of the general welcome that I've received. It's been great. So I wanted to kind of say, um, I think that what I want to do first off is um, for those that aren't familiar with like what my job is, I'm going to show kind of a reel and then I'm going to talk you guys through what it's like to be a costume concept artists are working with costume designers on major motion pictures and films, um, just in case it's something you're interested in so that you know the full scope of what our job is, what we do, um, and how specific it can be, okay? So let's start here. I'm gonna share my screen with you now. And I'll do a little presentation with you guys. Okay, so here we go. And this is, I'm going to start just with a little reel so you guys can see kind of the, you know, my concepts in action. to kill him. Official shield activity. You are not fit to be a king. So that is my showreel for my costumes. Uh, the costumes that I've worked on are some of them. 
Um, and I hope that that's something that you guys can see kind of the stark contrast between the, um, the what's drawn versus what we, you know, what actually makes it to the screen. But a lot of those things, if not most of them, are all drawn before you get cost, you know, you get the actual costumes that you guys are used to seeing. Um, so let me do this really quickly. Um, you guys can see me, right? So basically what I end up doing here is I, um, uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I work with a costume designer, um, you know, so I, I end up coming in, costume designer meets with me, um, and we kind of start to general, like a general basis going from general to specific, like painting, right? So I'll bring back up my presentation, but basically what we start with always is, is usually to get general direction I'm given the script to read so that I at least know what's going on, right? So, and you know, if there is a script, uh, sometimes there isn't one, you guys would be surprised. Um, but they'll give me a script to read. Then I sit down with the costume designer who's usually prepared something for me like a mood board or something for each character, something visual, right? Um, sometimes I do these myself, sometimes I put together things, but oftentimes my job is to provide the costume designer with visuals and kind of trying to draw that information out of their head. So it's a very kind of supportive, like, you know, um, collaboration in terms of, you know, what's going on. Um, so let me switch back to this again so you guys can see it. Um, and this is kind of, these are examples of what I start with usually. So they'll take a character and you have um, a certain amount or a certain direction um, and I even make, like I said, I end up making some of these myself just to keep myself occupied or busy um, or to keep myself in the frame of mind. You'll see up top, the one in the left hand corner with all the African masks. I made that mood board in the middle of doing Black Panther because I felt like my visual aesthetic was getting confused, like it wasn't African enough. So sometimes I'll take a break and do these, but these mood boards is, are generally what we start with. This was my, off, my office during a wrinkle in time. So this was like the initial impressions that I had um, working with director Ava DuVernay on trying to figure out each character or at least a general direction for each character to go. Um, and you'll see this like often and being surrounded by this really helps because it helps to keep you in the frame of mind that you need to be in to kind of get your job done, right? So it's just, you know, it could be anything. It could be fashion, it could be paintings, it could be architecture, buildings, um, old, uh, old, uh, old paintings, um, uh, stuff off Google. I mean, inspiration can come from anywhere, right? So, it, you know, it's like a, we do stuff like 3D printing, mathematical equations, all that stuff. That's kind of the general basis of where we are. So I want to show you kind of how this process will come together, which is this is Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, volume two. So I worked with costume designer Judiana Makovsky. And uh, I was responsible for doing a lot of the gold people, the sovereign. So initially, what the direction was, was they knew they were going to be gold, aesthetically beautiful and perfect. Um, and she said she wanted them to feel like columns. So you see the column shape. And she also said that she wanted them to maybe feel like Klimt. So like very gold and kind of precious and, you know, like all kinds of different pieces. And she also wanted, um, she was really a big fan of headdresses from the 20s and 30s, from like the silent films on, you know, like an old school Hollywood. So that was the direction that I was given. Past that, that's what I had. That was my brief, basically. So from there, I started to look at specialty costumes. There's a specialty costume room that is when, within every costume department, especially on big uh, features, right? So this door was next door, this, this room was next door to me. And you'll see all of these different pieces. These are pieces, these are from hardware stores, you know, the junkyard, from fabric stores. They're all different types of things. And, you know, uh, heat press, um, you know, and this is like them basically, the, the specialty costume team exploring what materials could be used to make these costumes. So you'll see me holding them up to the mannequin so that I can see scale. Um, trying to figure out which materials to use, um, which was a real treat because sometimes I don't have this. Um, but to have them next door, I was able to take detailed photos of each one of these things. And then this is what I started to use them for. So I started to use those textures in my drawing to start to figure out what these people could be, 
right? So then I started to do multiple variations of the gold people. Uh, of the, I had the handmaidens, um, Aisha's handmaidens. So that was my task. And I tried varying degrees of different shapes in order to get to what you see here on the right, the Contraxia version 8A. That's the closest to what it ended up being in the actual film. So that's about what it was. And you see it here when they are in the throne room. And then you see it here when they added fur because now they're out in the cold. Okay, and I'm actually gonna walk you through this. Uh, well, let's, let's do Captain Marvel and then I'll go back. So Captain Marvel, same process now. Now you can start to see the process. I was doing the training outfits for inspiration. So here's all of the different inspiration that I used. I was looking at different sports gear, um, uh, you know, compression suits, all of that stuff. Um, and that was something that I thought was super helpful, at least in terms of getting my, my frame of reference in mind, knowing that they were gonna be training and they were gonna be in space. So I did these illustrations, and at the time, I didn't know where they were gonna be. They said they might be in like a holographic training room, you know, or something along the lines of that. So I started to kind of, kind of see if I could piece these together. And you'll see I just kind of pose and kind of do my figure, put everything together and start to kind of like draw on top of it to see if I can come up with different ideas, right? Now, this is what they ended up looking like. So they ended up being more like a karate gi. So I put the kind of, you know, this in, uh, I'm losing my light here, but I will come back and get it later. Um, uh, I put this in just to kind of show that sometimes what we draw isn't what it ends up being, right? So the next thing is, is I have uh, Mr. Sam Jackson here. And I put this in, it was because I wanted to also show that we don't just draw superheroes. We have to draw people often in regular clothes. And you say, why do they want to see that? Well, oftentimes in movies, the costumes that you see, regardless of everything, aren't just bought. A lot of stuff is made for actors. That's why it ends up fitting so well. It's tailored, custom made for them, right? So they wanted to see what Sam would look like in his cop outfit as a, you know, as a young cop, as a young man. Um, and so we did varying degrees of this just to get it together. Supreme Intelligence. So the Supreme Intelligence, I also was another one where I didn't have very much information, didn't know what was kind of going on with the script um, in terms of what it was going to be. So I pulled from the comic book reference because that's what Marvel really likes to do is they very much so hold true to their source material. Um, and so I took a body, you'll see this body here that I posed in DAS 3D, um, which I will show you guys how that process works. And on the right hand side, you'll see some different moiré pattern, which is like that strobing effect and some organic stuff. And then down in the right hand corner, you'll see a, uh, some fabric that the costume designer Sonia Hayes wanted to use. So that was what she was kind of, she liked the layering of it and how organic it felt and maybe alien in nature, right? So once I posed the figure, I then did in Photoshop, I took that figure, multiplied it a few times and I drew the symmetry tool on and I created all these really weird, fantastical, you know, alien looking kind of shapes. Uh, knowing that it might be something of a construct, the, the supreme intelligence is presenting itself as this, you know, earthly being, but still maybe has some kind of ties to what it looks like in the comic book, which is the tubes and the tentacles and all of that stuff. So from there, I took that same pose from Daz and I put it into a program called Keyshot. Now in Keyshot, I'm actually going to pause here and share Keyshot with you guys for a little bit. So let's go here and let me turn my light back on because I lost it. There we go. Um, let's see here. It would be, let's open up Keyshot and I can show it to you and show you kind of what that looks like. Um, so, Okay, so here's Keyshot. So I've taken a basic figure that I put into DAS, and you can see that we can pan around, look at it, move it, and I just basically turned this basic figure into an OBJ so that I could put it in a Keyshot, right? So I've got this figure in a 3D space. Now, 
with the process that I was just showing you guys that I was supreme intelligence, I know that I wanted her to be kind of like have some kind of shiny green, maybe armor or something like that, right? So what we do is we simply just drag the material onto the figure. Uh -oh. There we go. So you can see from there that already, just from having this model, I can drag and put materials into it. I can change the lighting. Um, and that helps me, you know, and there's all kinds of different things. Like we wanted to do gemstones. I'm putting it on different ones. Like let's do it here. So it's like, you can see how it affects the figure, right? Or right now it's affecting the clothes, but it's different. It's basically, you can take all of these different materials and it's really easy to then put whatever kind of material you want onto them, right? Um, so that's kind of how I did that process. Now let me switch back to showing you guys the process of where I was going with the presentation again. So, okay. So from there, you can see basically, I did different varying passes on um, varying the materials and kind of making it so that it gave me these very kind of cool organic shapes, just randomness, right? So I kind of played with a little bit. Um, and from there, I started to do this, which is I combined that dad's figure you guys saw before, and I combined the key shot version of what I did. And then I started to just pick and choose which, which pieces of it I wanted to use, right? So I kind of erased out parts, put stuff in, added a skirt, added the tentacles. Um, and I came up with the versions that you saw earlier that the costume designer, Sonia, picked. I blew each one of those up, and then I started to play within the specifications of what I had. And then again, <laughs> this is what she ended up looking like. So <laughs> after all of that, she still ended up kind of looking very basic and simple. So I just say, again, here we go again. I have no idea what ended up going on there, but that's kind of where we were. So from here, um, <laughs> this happens often, but you have to get used to it. Um, I, I enjoyed that part of it. Let me see if I can show you guys a little bit more of that process. Um, hey, Vincent, um, just a quick question. Sure. Uh, there were a couple actually that came through. Um, yeah. Love what you've been showing so far. Uh, you showed us that wall. How much time do you spend uh, in research? Um, and then also, do you give yourself a deadline on these projects? Yes, yes and yes. Um, research is a big part of what we do. So a lot of the times, because um, you'll notice even in the concept work that I do, it's a lot more detailed than like, just kind of say like if you were doing like a keyframe or a mood board or, you know, like, or like a moody kind of um, concept, right? Where you're trying to say, okay, this is, uh, you know, uh, the supreme intelligence fighting you know aliens or whatever in that in that way if you were doing that concept especially before costume is done you probably make something up that's fantastical and there's you know flames and all kinds of stuff happening right my job is to make sure that everyone from down the line from costume designer all the way down until the, the costume is complete every single person that's watching that thing or, or looking at that illustration should be able to kind of get a basis on what to make um, so the mood boards, the research, that's a big part of how we start, but it's also not up to me to do it alone, meaning that oftentimes we have researchers, um, we have people working at the library, um, the costume designers doing a bunch of research themselves, they'll give me research and then that'll like kind of spark my creativity or my, um, that'll inspire me to say, oh, or, or like this, and then I've got reference. So I go a lot to the library. I go a lot on, you know, the normal stuff, Google, Pinterest, um, uh, Getty Images. Um, I've also started to use as a really great website, photobash.org, that has a bunch of different um, materials, like in terms of like stuff you can kind of like bash into your um, like, like environments and stuff like that. Um, so, and then I look at fashion a lot. So look at the, one of the, the resources I use a lot is Vogue.com. Because Vogue.com, you can see every single fashion show uh, in every collection as far back as like, you know, early 2000s, even some of the 90s. Um, and then deadline wise, deadlines are always based on the project. So sometimes I have, you know, half a day, sometimes I have a day. 
sometimes I've got a week on a character. So it really depends on what pacing we're going through because there's so much work going into them. Um, there's so much work going into each concept that you really can't tell. You just have to try and pace yourself to saying, okay, I'm drawing a lab coat, so I'm obviously, excuse me, I'm drawing variations of a sci-fi lab coat, so I'm not gonna spend you know, two days on that. I'm gonna try and do that by lunchtime. Like, I'm gonna try and knock that out and give the costume designer, you know, 15 variations that they're now narrow, narrow down to like three, you know? So, but then if I'm doing a concept where I already know what it is, or even a concept like the ones I just showed you, that I probably had a week to explore and just play. So my first day was doing the thumbnails and showing the thumbnails. And then the next day, the costume designer, she picked which one she liked. I started to blow those up and the rest of the week, I just worked on trying to figure out what those were gonna be. And then they were presented that Friday. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah no the problem. questions are kind of coming in now. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, the, the Alec has um, got a question about the fashion website you mentioned. Yeah. And, and uh, the other question that came in uh, was uh, Sylvester. How do you stay persistent? How do you push through these huge mm -hmm. projects? Besides the obvious, uh, you know, got to pay the bills. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a big motivator, honestly. Like once I had my daughter, it was kind of one of those things with my, with my family. A big motivator is just making sure that I'm providing for my family um, and making sure that I am, um, you know, being productive, you know, because I, I really don't, you don't have another option. Um, but past that, I enjoy the work. So I enjoy um, uh, like kind of staying, I, I enjoy the work enough to where it keeps me aware. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's stressful, but I don't feel like I'm working so much and I still can't believe people pay me to draw. It's just the weirdest thing. Um, and so I think with that, with that said, I think one of the hardest things that you experience is burnout. Um, I do just like anybody else, I get burned out. Or if I'm working on multiple things at a time, it's really hard for me to switch gears. So if I'm working on Black Panther, but then I'm also working on Wrinkle in Time and I'm doing drawings for Supergirl, which that actually did happen. I was working on three of these projects all at once. Sometimes your mind gets muddled because you're like, okay, well, I'm in this mode and I've got to switch to this. And then once the deadlines start kind of overlapping, like you turn some work in and I, you know, whoop, you know, like after you get your deadline, you go, ah, oh, you feel great, right? You feel amazing. It's great to turn that work in. And then in the middle of working on something else, that work jumps back in. And then they say, okay, now there's more changes. You know, so you just kind of, you have to keep pacing yourself, kind of knock things off, you know, uh, get yourself a schedule. And also, I think it's really important for every artist to find out when they work best. It doesn't, it's not the same for everyone. Um, Costume illustrators normally work a 10 hour day and we work around eight to 6.30. So we're, that's our normal day, Monday through Friday, is working from eight to around six or 6.30, right? Um, but what I found is that I'm often more productive, especially when I can work at home because I'm not an eight to 6.30 person. I, I'm most creative if I start work at around 10. So that's when my brain starts to kind of come to life. And some people are lit night owls. They come to life at nighttime. Um, I just find that if I'm able to kind of get up in the morning, go to the gym, you know, drop my daughter off, have a little breakfast, start work at 10, I'm a lot more productive. So I've learned that about myself. So when I do have to keep myself to the deadline of eight to six, I structure it around knowing that in the morning, I'll probably do research, answer emails, um, do kind of my business stuff first so that when it starts nearing that 10 o'clock range, that's when I start to sprint forward. And then I'll usually have my first stuff by around lunchtime. So around noon, one o'clock is when I have something to show. Designer checks in, I eat, and then I finish out my day and then check in with them one more time before the end of the day. Um, and then you said there was a question about the fashion website. Uh, the the, the we question was, um, was, it, uh, was there a particular website that you went to or do you go to a bunch of different websites? Oh. Fashion yeah, had mentioned. So it was just, I do, the main one I use is Vogue.com. So if you go there and you kind of start playing around, like they have it sorted by fashion designer, which is something that I would suggest you guys all start to look at too, is I don't ever, um, uh, I don't usually um, uh, jump around too much. I, I looked up specific fashion terms, which is something that I will say for you guys as well. Like you all know, the, the more specific you can be with Google, right, the better. So like one person searching Google is different than another person searching Google based on the terminology you use or like 
if you know the difference between stuff. So it's like, if I go to look up stuff, I'm looking up very specific things based on what I've learned being in costume for so long. So it's like, you might look up and say, oh, uh, uh, you know, uh, structured wrinkles or something, but then I'll say pin tucking. So different, it's like knowing the terminology um, helps you. And then from there, once I start to do my terminology and kind of be more specific in my searches, for fashion, I usually go to Vogue.com because that gives me a base of knowing who the designers are, what designers usually are good at doing what, um, and then getting inspiration, right? And then you have your favorite designers. So you'll start saying like, oh, I really like Alexander McQueen, or I like this person for this or this person for that. And they're just jump off points, but they do help you to know. I, I got a quick question. Um, just so it was actually referencing a little bit about how you got your start because uh, you said you started out as an illustrator, but at some point you made a jump into becoming uh, involved with the costume stuff. Uh, did you go to fashion school to learn it or did you just get it as you go? Um, no, I got it as I went. So I went to school um, at Cal State Long Beach um, and I studied, I had a general illustration degree. So that's just, it's across the board. I did color theory, I did nude figure drawing, costume figure drawing, oil painting, gouache, watercolor, storyboarding, uh, sequential imagery. Um, I just had a very broad illustration just learning to draw background traditionally. And matter of fact, I didn't have Photoshop. I'm actually going to age myself now. I didn't have Photoshop taught to me until my last semester of college. So it wasn't like something that I learned. Like I learned it and I was really annoyed by it. Like I actually didn't like it at first. Um, I remember learning Photoshop and Illustrator um, and being like, what's the pen tool? What, what layers, what? Like, I was just so confused um, and, um, and not really understanding and going through that frustration of uh, doing traditional work and then trying to scan it in the computer and then trying to digitally paint it and trying to figure out how that all worked. Um, but it really was just a mileage and a time thing. But I for the most part, was just taught to draw. And so I thought, oh, I'll go into, I like drawing people. So I was like, maybe I'll do video games or I'll do um, uh, character design for animation or, um, you know, Wizards of the Coast or, or uh, World of Warcraft, like, or Blizzard. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Comics, um, children's books, it was all, or editorial illustration. It was just, we were trained with a very broad scope. Um, but I knew I liked drawing people and I knew I wanted to work in film. So for me, where my kind of aha moment came was I had a, a designer um, teacher at Long Beach, Robin Richardson. She was a costume illustrator and a storyboard artist, which, which when you guys get into it, those are two different unions. One of them is 800, which is the Art Directors Guild, and the other one is 892, which is the Costume Designers Guild, which is what I'm a part of. So she was a part of both. So she's able to work on different, you know, different avenues. Um, so she kind of had told us what she did, you know, during the course of our, um, our education, but she didn't really talk about it as much. She would just say, oh, you know, we say, hey, Robin, what'd you do over the summer? She like, oh, I storyboarded this movie Aeon Flux, you know, and she'd show us her drawings. And we're like, oh, cool. You know, we would just be like, but it wasn't something we knew. So after we graduated, I went with three of my friends to Comic-Con in San Diego, the big comic convention. Um, and there was a panel of costume designers from the Costume Designers Guild there. So we went to their panel and we were showing our portfolios just across the board. So we were showing them to Blizzard, Wizards of the Coast, like all the places you normally would show your portfolio. Um, and then we saw the costume designers and we went down the line and we showed them our portfolios. Well, my friend Oksana, who's also a costume illustrator, she ends up getting a call the very next week. So keep in mind the timing. We graduated in June. We went to Comic-Con in July. So this is like our first month of being like out of, you know, college, out of school and not knowing what you're going to do with your life, which is what most students end up doing, right? Um, and the next week after Comic-Con, Oksana gets a call from Isis Musenden, who's the costume designer that did Narnia. And she says, hey, how would you like to come with me to Prague to do Narnia 2? I really liked your portfolio. For eight months, she was gone. So she leaves and goes to Prague and tell, tells me and my other friend, Brian, who were also there. And we're like, wow, that's a real job. So I took out a loan from my credit union because the expense fee of joining the guild isn't super cheap. It's like 2000 something dollars, I think, somewhere in there. 
And I joined the costume designers guild as an illustrator. And that next month, I got a call to do the Mummy Three with Sonya Hayes, who also did Captain Marvel. So that was like a full circle moment for me. But she was the first person to hire me and give me a break in drawing and doing costume illustration. And so I worked on that job for six months. Um, and then I went to Montreal. That was my first time traveling there to go and see some of the filming of it um, and watch some fight sequences and stuff like that so I could learn. Um, and then from that point, just getting back to the question, I ended up picking up a lot of knowledge on costume. And then every designer that I work with, I learned something different. So you don't have to be in a fashion school or anything like, like that. It's just if you have interest in character and costume, then the best thing you can do is to prepare yourself by taking in more of that information. Um, and that's kind of what I've done. And so I've been lucky and I've worked ever since that time. So I basically got in a month later. Then Brian, the other friend that was there with us, Brian saw that me and Oksana were working. So he joined. And his first job, he got Star Trek with J.J. Abrams, the, the reboot of Star Trek. So then they needed another illustrator. So the end of my first year, I worked on Star Trek with Brian, which was awesome. And the costume designer for that was Michael Kaplan. And Michael Kaplan also did Blade Runner. So we were just nerding out the whole time, like the original Blade Runner. So it was like, it was just a cool experience. And then I, from there, I just, I kept going. So you just have to be open to learning and then kind of use those skills and then kind of apply them you know, in the right area. That's, uh, that's an amazing response. I love the answer about you took out a loan to go into the guild, which puts you in a pool mm -hmm. for people to see you. I, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, I, I, I say that, I, I want to point that out because sometimes when you're a student, you kind of balk at like, well, that seems expensive to do or whatever, but it's like, it was the investment that you made in yourself that said, you know what? Um, I can play and swim in those waters. And then yeah. um, sure enough, it just got you visible. And got me visible. You know, that's, that's an exactly amazing what it was. story, especially coming out of school uh, the way you did. So I think uh, sometimes we talk ourselves out of thinking we're not worthy, but we are. You just got to decide that you are and then give it a chance. And you were obviously ready. It so, also helps to, there was, there was a few key things of advice in there. Um, that people had told me along the way, like in college, I was very active in working um, and, and trying to find different jobs, excuse me, trying to find interest. And I had a regular job at one point I had, I was working at a credit union and I was just the person that greeted you at the front. And then I started doing loans and stuff. And I kept going further and further down the past path where I was doing more and more and more and more, right? Now, Someone told me, I forget who it was, otherwise I would credit them, but someone told me when I was in my first year of college that um, the, like, it takes about three years once you get out of school before people are calling you more than you're calling them. So there's like a time difference, right? That's probably sped up now because of the internet and social media and all that stuff. It's probably a lot shorter because you can start working and put yourself out there more. But I knew because of that, I was very aware that I wanted to kind of speed up that timetable for myself. because so I was like, three years, I want to work right when I get out of school. So every semester that I had off, so every break, like winter break, summer break, I worked on something. I either worked on a film, I did something, and at the time I was production designing. So my friends said, hey, you like to draw, do you want a production design? So I was doing set design, and I was doing student films, and I was doing commercials, and I was doing music videos. And so I really got into doing a lot of music videos. So by the time I got out of school, even with the Costume Designers Guild, I was jumping back and forth between costume illustrating, which that normal job when you're on a movie is probably anywhere from like three to four to six months. It could be two, a couple of weeks. But you, don't, you never know, each job is different. But generally about three months on a big project is what you have to like design and kind of get everything done. So I do a movie, then I'd go back and do a big music video, then I'd go back and do a movie, then I, I'd, I'd jump back and forth before a point where costume kind of took off for me to where I couldn't production design as much. And so that's kind of where I ended up being. But through all of that, I was very, very adamant. Even if you don't know exactly what you want to do, all of you are artists. So you know you want to be an artist. So if I can encourage you, especially while you're younger and you have the time, um, it would be to be unyielding in the fact that you want to be an artist. Because what you do is you settle. I bring up the credit union and say, 
I started as a as the person the person that greets you at the front desk of the credit union while I was trying to do all of this stuff. And then, you know, then I started doing, you know, I was putting, um, you know, doing transactions where I put your money into your account and all of that stuff. And anybody that mailed in checks, I was putting money in their account. Then they moved me to being a loan officer. So I was doing loans for people. So that required me to go and sit down and do that. Then they were like trying to get me more hours. And so at a certain point, I started to, I could see it, I quit. And they were super upset with me. And they were like, are you gonna, you, are you, are you gonna be with this? Are you gonna do your thing? And I said, you know, I said, I would rather go and work at an art store or, or something that requires art because I know that's what I wanna do. I knew that I didn't wanna look back 10 years from that point and be, you know, a manager of a bank. Like, I just knew that that wasn't my thing. Um, and I think that that's something, not to say not go out and quit your jobs. I'm just saying, mentally, I was always knowing that I wanted to do film and I wanted to draw people and I wanted to work in film in some capacity. So I was very adamant about, even if you don't know exactly what you wanna do, I was very adamant about working in those, in those spaces and making myself visible in, and available to that space. Hey, we got a couple of questions about tools and software. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I wanted to kind of maybe sort of roll them together. Okay. Uh, there was a question about what was the most used software when it comes to designing these concepts. And then to dovetail that, uh, is ZBrush helpful when it comes to costume? And uh, what's the advantage of Keyshot instead of Marmoset? You know, um, it was a little bit of a trifecta, but there were three software related or, or tools related questions. So I figured let's get them to you all at once and then maybe you can kind of uh, work them through. All right. Give me that. Give me the very first part again. The first question. Uh, software most often used. Um, ah. Yeah. And then after that, you know, you can go from there. All right. So I, I primarily it's, it's, it's shifting now. Um, but I spend most of my day in uh, Photoshop. Okay. That's primarily what I do between Daz 3D and Photoshop. Um, and I'm going to write that down for you guys because sometimes people have never heard of that program. Um, uh, between Daz 3D and Photoshop um, and then ZBrush. Like ZBrush is very useful in costume. ZBrush is especially useful in costume for superheroes or hard surface armor. Um, anything that requires that type of sculptural element, it's much easier to be able to create those shapes in ZBrush, um, especially one of the biggest ones for us is helmets. Like I remember before, you know, dr like imagine drawing a helmet and rendering it and then doing it from every angle and then there's changes. How annoying, right? Not so much in ZBrush because you can sculpt it out, you get the general shape, you can draw on top of it, you can make notes, they have changes, you can do that, but it's, it's, a, it's a much better tool for that because you have something in 3D space that you can move and change around and it's you're changing it all at once as opposed to changing different views of it. So it's been very helpful for that. Um, and then also for my process, I wasn't a traditional sculptor, so I'm still learning ZBrush as I go along, along with a program called Marvelous Designer, which is better for draping, right? So some of you guys use that. I've been learning to use that as well. Um, I think that those things all kind of blend together. Um, so I, I'd say Whereas before I spent like 100% of the day in Photoshop almost, now it's like split between Daz, Photoshop, and ZBrush. So it's like I'm kind of jumping between all those programs. Uh, did you have any more um, samples that you could show in yeah. uh, some of those parts of the process? Just I'll show, um, let me see. I actually just, I pulled up Daz just so you guys could show what I'm talking about or see what I'm talking about. Cause I know a lot of people are familiar with that program. Um, and I'll just show you kind of a general basis of what I do when I use it. Mm -hmm. So this is Daz and You'll see, I'll just kind of go through a little bit of the menu really quick so you guys can see, but basically you, you can buy, they give you pre, 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 it's a free program. They give you pre people that you can use, which is basically they've got like a general list of people. Um, I've gone into uh, using, I've got different figures that I've purchased. So if you'll see here, I'm going to the menu for female, Genesis 8, and they're all labeled by Genesis. So every new one, like the next one will be Genesis 9, and that'll be the new figure or whatever. Um, um, and then there's characters, clothing, all of those things, and um, poses. So if you see here, like, well, see here, these are all the characters that I have currently. 
so I use these, but they do have these things where like we can say, I can change the proportion. So we've got this character here. Let me put her onto the screen proper. And we've got her in 3D space. Let me unselect this, right? And say I know who the actress is. What I usually end up doing is I start with a figure like this and I go into shaping. So let's do this. So I've got all of the different morphs or the different kind of, you know, things that I can create with this character. And if I know who it is or who the actor is, I can say, okay, well, this actress is a little heavier. So I can start to change the proportions um, of the character. Uh oh, hold on one second here. It's not actually doing what I want it to do. Let me actually start this over. Give me a second. Uh, let's go again. I'm going to reload the figure just because it's doing something weird where it's not giving me, it's not changing the proportions. But you can change the proportions of the figure. You can, um, let's clothe our figure. Um, you can change the proportions of the figure. You can uh, change, you can change pretty much anything. So I, I wanna show that if it, it'll allow me to do it. Let me see. There we go. So see how now the body is changing? So it's like, this is a bodybuilder size. I can make the character oh, emaciated. I can go into specific parts. Like I can say, if I wanted to, uh, let's say, let's go into, I don't know, the hands. Um, I mean, it's right down to, if you even look at this, like let's look at the hands right now. I can make, I can change the nails. I can do all kinds of stuff. So I, I just wanna bring this up to show, I use this often because this is how I start. Um, I start the process and I adjust all of my proportions for the actors that I'm using. Um, and then in posing, you can either pose manually or you can buy poses. So what I do is I have a bunch of different poses that I use where click on the figure. It comes with a few, but some of them you're going to have to buy. So think about it in this way. I always think about it where it's basically this program, especially for people that have kids, you'll know those video games where they tell you it's free. And then when you get the game in order for it to be fun, you have to buy everything. That's what Daz is like. <laughs> so I hope that makes a little bit more sense. Um, but it does help to have different poses. You just click on them and it will change my figure. So, um, and I have a bunch of different ones. So it's like, say I'm doing a fight scene or whatever, I will change the body. You know, I think I use some of these for some of the work. I've used a lot of these actually. Um, uh, let's see if I can find one that's fun. Yeah, like, so, We've got this figure, it's all posed and say, let's say, let's say we want her to be doing something more like Captain Marvel. So we go to posing, we, maybe we twist. You can kind of just change this to where you want it to be. So see, you can do things like this maybe, or maybe we're doing like Scarlet Witch or something like that, where we've got, she's using magic or something. So you can, you can do all kinds of different things with it, which I really enjoy. Um, and, then, and you can see how quickly Hey, Phil. Yeah. 
doing that. Um, just quick, quick question. Um, are you able to export uh, these models to other software packages? Yes. Like Maya or ZBrush to be able to work with them? Yes. So actually, that's, um, let's do this now. You can pose them and then use them on different things. So like if I go to, here's that same figure that I had just shown you before. I'm going to Here's that same figure in ZBrush. So I had exported it as an OBJ, I put it in here, and I use this often. You can sculpt right on top of it. A lot of the times, too, the symmetry is great. So the only thing that I haven't been quite able to figure out is I know that there is a way, um, there's a way to get it to where, like, right now, if I use this figure, it's the symmetry is on, right? So I can sculpt and it will be perfectly symmetrical, which usually that's great. Posing is also easier in DAS but then you don't, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have the capability where if you pose it, then it loses its symmetry sometimes, right? Or things will break in ZBrush. So I've been trying to kind of figure that out because I know that there's a way where you could sculpt, say, and say you export this to ZBrush. You could sculpt on it with the symmetry tool, tool on in, in the T-Pose. And from what I understand, ZBrush now does a thing to where if you bring that same figure in again and it's posed from Daz, right, like in a cool posed thing, it will morph or match them. Um, some things will break, but it'll get it to where your pose will meld into, so you're not having to pose in ZBrush, which can be a little bit hard. So I've been trying to kind of figure that out, um, but for the most part, I'll usually sculpt everything in this pose, and I'll just sculpt all my costume stuff on top of it, and then I'll pose it kind of in the direction I want, and then I'll use it just like I do anywhere, anywhere else. I'll Photoshop the parts that I sculpted into my illustration. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's helpful for you guys to see that you can have this and you know change your materials and sculpt and use it. Um, but I do use it often. Um, and then I think, uh, let me go back to this really quickly because I wanted to show you guys a few more things in it. Um, once you have your figure posed, you can also, let's say, I just wanna show you a few more things. You can, let's see, there's packages even for saying, let's go to this guy, hands. So we've got that, that uh, let's see, right hand. You'll also see that I can do things like this. To see how the hand is changing over there. So that also helps you because you can do things that are kind of fun. Um, uh, but it's like there's a bunch of different there's a bunch of different things that you can use for this. So I don't want to give you too much. I just want to say that you're able to change things as best you can. You can also light in this program. And then what I'll do is I'll basically go to let's say to I've got some light presets that I've already used. Let's go to ones just so that it's easy for you guys to see. Not that one. Let's say I wanted to do even just something more dramatic. So it's lighting it now. And if I go to this view, it'll show me what that light looks like once it renders. So that's kind of what it'll end up looking like if I rendered it now. So I can light, add rim light, I can create new lights, I can do all of that stuff. So normally, I'll start here. This is the place that I start my work. Um, and then from there, I put that into Photoshop and then I start to draw on top of it, which I can show you guys that process as well a little bit. Let me see. Go ahead. Um, I was gonna say that, uh... You know, this is uh, starting to kind of give us a preview to the class that you are uh, going to be teaching, uh, mm -hmm. EMA. Uh, so it's nice to see that we're getting a little preview of what students are going to be in store. Um, so thrilled about that part. Uh, we have a couple of other questions. Uh, from, yes, please ask. Yeah, uh, Alec Chalmers uh, was asking a couple of questions um, about the uh, dialogue that you have with the costume design. What's yeah. that like and how much input do they have during the process? 
Um, it's very, it's very collaborative. They have a, a big part of the, um, they have a big part of the process um, in terms of, it depends on each designer. Some designers are very hand on, hands on, like uh, they give you sketches and they say, okay, I, I specifically want this character to look like this. Some are more open because we're doing conceptual work where they're just like, okay, I know I have Tom Cruise and he needs to be dressed in, I want him to be dressed in dove white gray and he's on an alien planet. That might be as much as you get from them with reference of like motorcycle gear and all kinds of stuff. And then you conceptualize and then you end up with what you saw in Oblivion, right? So it's like, it depends, but they definitely go back and forth. Um, it's a big back and forth process. So you definitely have to allow your creative process to uh, meld with another person. And so I think that that's another reason why I've been somewhat successful in the sense that I can do that with multiple people, which sometimes I know for artists, that's very difficult. Even just <laughs> com communicating that much with a another person can be difficult, but I go back and forth often. Um, and then there's other times where the designer says, you know what, I'm not necessarily familiar with these characters, you know, like the world that we're building, they're learning them. And they say, I know that you know these characters, what do you think? Or how do you like, how do you think we should proceed? Or what's the strongest thing? Or what's the most iconic thing for fans that they'd be like, that they would really want to see? You know, what's, what's the thing that like, what can we change? What can we not change? You know, it's that, it's those types of things. And other times it's just, you know, how subtle can this be? What, um, what does this costume say about this person always? Um, so that dialogue is very fruitful. It's also a learning dialogue, but it's also very much so like being one, like you have to make sure you're combining your artistic talents and creative mind with another creative. It's collaborative for sure. Um, I'm just gonna click through these. You guys can ask more questions. I'm gonna click through these just so you can see how I layer up the process. So you saw the DAS model, and I'm just gonna click through my history so that you can see how this kind of comes together. But please ask more questions. I did see something in the chat too when people were talking about using 3D in their work and, and um, artists considering it cheating. Um, that's something that like, I think as all artists, we all go through that, that phase or that, that thing. In production art, when you're working so fast, if you can imagine sometimes I might have a day, like the project I'm on right now, I can't talk about, but the project that I'm on, I did one fully rendered character a day for the past two weeks. So it's like, in order to do that, there's no way that I can let my artist ego be like, I gotta paint that face and paint that body and rim light, 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 like, unless you're really good at that and even still, I don't have enough time for that. So I have to grab stuff and I have, I have to get to working on the costume and, <clears throat> and what my job is as soon as possible. So that's the goal. Like you have to do what it is that you need to do in order to meet your deadlines. Not to say that you're grabbing like, now the thing I won't do is some people will go and they'll grab things offline like all willy nilly. I'm not gonna grab anyone's artwork or put it in my, like I'm gonna try and create as best I can something custom but I do have to at least start with using it. It's just a tool like anything else. You use it as a tool, right? Um, let me see here. You can see here that process. Um, the other thing that I do, I'll show you guys this really quickly, is you can see how this is coming together. This is the body. And basically what I'll do is I'll tone the body, the parts that I know are gonna be covered. I tone them in grayscale and then I'll colorize them. Um, and then I move into blurring out the pieces, you know, like obviously the breast can't be separated in that way because they're going to be covered. So I kind of, you know, paint them to where it looks like there's a bodysuit. Then I added in the moray that I showed you guys in the presentation, which is this kind of strobing effect. So I created a pattern of moray and layered that into my work, right, as an undersuit layer. Then I added the key shot render that I showed you guys and pick the pieces that I wanted from that. Then I added a skirt that I had pushed and pulled and pulled out a ZBrush, and then turned the transparency down because I wasn't sure what it was gonna be made out of. This fabric was fiber optic, and it was something that we wanted to play with and use. So then I added that kind of instrumentation into my paneling, and then I lit it. 
So you can see that this process, and I'm doing it over and over and over again until I get to a point where And these are all, if you go back, those drawings that I showed you guys earlier, the thumbnails, this black, the black line work, that's my thumbnail. I just blew it up. So I did, that's the exact thing that I did in Photoshop, just blew it up. And then I started to mess around with it and see what I could come up with. And then someone had asked me about this too, because I try to keep fabric to being as specific as I can. That fabric that's added in that underdress right now is that fabric I showed you guys in the presentation, the wavy stuff. Um, but it's also uh, beta fish tails. So sometimes I'll creatively think about like, okay, what looks like fabric? And obviously fish scales look like that. So you can start to see, but that's, I wanted to show you guys that because that's the process that I use. Um, that's the process that I use usually most of the time. A couple of other questions. I um, actually just saw the clock and I'm like, wow, we got a couple of minutes left. No problem. I'm still uh, down to stay if anybody wants to stay. Um, there was, um, let's see, we got a question here. Actually, this is a good question. Um, uh, Alec uh, brought it up um, and it's about this balance that we need to have uh, being more mindful about cultural sensitivity and mm -hmm. appropriation mm -hmm. when it comes to looking at other cultures. It's always that balance, you know, um, some of my favorite artists have always smartly known where to go research um, to get inspiration from other cultures. But, you know, it's funny to kind of hear like, you know, points of view about people saying, hey, that's our stuff. And you're just, you know, and I don't know where that line is. I really don't know if there is such a thing. I think uh, as we get more global as uh, an audience, uh, I think that sharing of cultures is going to happen naturally. But what you, you know, what, what, what's your take on that? Because it's an interesting um, uh, question. It's, it's about education. I think one of the first things that I see, especially with, with the use of the term uh, cultural appropriation, right, is so many people use it incorrectly. Like, it's not like, oh, my culture did this, so you can't draw that or you can't use it. That's not cultural appropriation at all. It's if the best, if I can try to describe it and not get too, um, too into it. It's when something that your culture has brought or that your culture has created, it's when that thing is used by another culture and it benefits them, but you're uh, downgraded for it. So it's like, if you, uh, like, I don't know, like it's, I was trying to find an example. Um, uh, like a good example, I mean, it's, it's a difficult one, but it's, it's if you were talking about it in a way of like, like say the hairstyle dreads, right? Like African hair naturally dreads. Like if you leave it alone, it's dry, it starts to kind of coarsely together, it'll just dread naturally. No other real he hair texture does that without a lot of work or without it being something where, you know, it's uh, maybe um, dirty or like, it, it's, it's definitely hard to explain. It, it requires work and I don't want to be insensitive or sit insensitive to anyone that wants them, but dreads naturally are that way. Now, cultural appropriation would be if someone that's not of African descent or of African hair goes and starts to wear dreads and they're praised like, oh, beautiful. But then if an African person wears dreads, they're like, oh, they're dirty. Oh, you know, you're unprofessional. That's cultural appropriation. Anything else that falls outside of that, it's not like, oh, well, since you're, you know, uh, black, you can't draw kimonos. Or wait, that's 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 a confusing subject, and I think that the education of knowing what those terms mean then makes it to where you don't have to be as sensitive because you understand what you're doing. And then also, it's like we should all draw from that pool of creativity from each other. Like that's the best part. Like. The best thing is being able to, you know, say I'm going to draw a little Asian girl with dreads rocking a, you know, some kind of Celtic tattoo with, you know, uh, you know, Tibetan jacket floral print. I don't know, like, that's fun. So I, I, I don't want it to be where you guys feel it has to be super sensitive. We do try to keep in mind, especially working in films, because they're going to be seen all over that we want to be respectful to culture. So you don't want to just rip something off or take something or like if something's sensitive to a culture, like if this culture says we only wear this garment for this specific thing and it's honoring our ancestors, you obviously don't want to just put it in some flippant place 
that disrespects it. So um, that's kind of the best way that I can describe it. So it's like, and also too, it'd be great every once in a while, which they're starting to learn, is that for certain things, they're now hiring people in a more diverse way to allow those people to tell that story. Not everyone can tell that, you know, a specific person's story, you know, or a specific culture story. So what not better, especially because there are people of all backgrounds working in film, than to say, okay, well, maybe we step back and we allow these people to tell their own story, um, which is what you're starting to see a lot. And um, so I think it's changing, um, but I hope that answers that question. I think that most, with me for most things, the only way you can have those conversations is to educate yourself about them and what that what they actually mean. Because um, a lot of people try to pull up to the conversation, especially in the age of social media, where you can have an opinion about everything and you can just have a trigger reaction to like a few words. I feel like instead of doing that, it's good to pull back and say, okay, what is this topic about? What does this actually mean? And then trying to have a conversation with other people that do the exact same thing. Yeah, I think uh, I think you have a great point. I also think it's, um, you know, I, in my opinion, I'd rather see that cultural representation in some fashion than, you know, sometimes, you know, waiting for the people who are supposedly the stewards of the cake caretakers of their own culture, you know, if there's a way to get this out there so that people know about it, to me, I would rather have that than to never know about it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I mean, you know, so it's an interesting conversation and I'd rather, yeah. you know, err on the side of, of, of getting that exposure, but it's great to see that it's happening uh, and that it's happening uh, very, you know, you know, it's happening in the, in, in the industry in a way that uh, I'm excited to see. Um, and I know uh, that you are as well. So. I am very excited to see it. It's happening a lot more. Um, and I, I think you also, if you see, if you look at children, that's also the easiest way to see what the changes are. Like, I know as much as I had to struggle or fight for different visual representations and things from being, you know, young in the industry, um, which I didn't mention, I forgot, is that one of the key things that kind of formulated my mind moving forward was I was an actor from the time I was three till around 16 or 17. So I did all of these like projects and I was on TV and I did different things until a point where I didn't want to really do that anymore. So when I went to college, I did have the frame of mind to know, to know that I did want to do film, but I just wasn't sure what. And the only other thing I ever did was I drew in my trailer. Um, and so from that point, I remember the struggle of getting great roles specifically for like African-American men on screen or for black males on screen was uh, troubling. It was hard. That's the reason why I stopped acting, because I didn't like the roles that I was being offered. I felt like they were very stereotypical, um, which is a big part of my background, which is why now I do what I do, which is I try to mix things up where I try to throw people off, where I try to add in different cultures when I can um, to throw that balance off. But I look at my daughter and she doesn't have those same things. You know, she grew up, her, her president is Obama and Michelle. You know, that, like, that's her first thing. And then she has Black Panther and she's got uh, the DreamWorks movie Home and she's got uh, Wrinkle in Time. Like, she's got all these different representations of herself now where her fight for that, it just won't be, it, she won't even have that frame of mind. So I think it's something that you have to look at them in order to be able to see the change sometimes, especially when you're in it, because your mindset, we as humans change slowly. And often you drag that with yourself and you don't see the change. So I do see the change. We have a long way to go, but I do see changes happening for the positive. That's great. I'm glad. Uh, we have one more question, if sure. we have time, because I just saw that. Sure. No, I'm, I'm completely fine. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's... Um, we got um sylvester had a good question he actually asked it from the beginning of the um the um the webinar he said if you had to go back in time when you're starting out at marvel what's the advice you would give yourself to be more productive and stay ahead of deadlines Ooh, um i probably would have told myself to get into 3d faster um and i'm by that i mean giving myself the opportunity. The first, the, I worked on Captain America um, and that was my first Marvel, like Marvel Cinematic Universe job. And I was in costume and there wasn't a visual development department yet. It was, and I was working with Ryan Minerding and Charlie Wynn, who you know now are just, they're rock stars, they're amazing. Um, and that was my first job 
where I started to really see concept, like the term concept art, like where I understood what was happening because I was used to working as a costume illustrator, which is you're usually drawing the things that the costume designer either can't draw or can't communicate better than them, but they're kind of either feeding you the ideas or at a certain point, they're kind of telling you what they want to see. As concept art started to catch up and costumes started to change and I started to be around all these amazing artists, I started to realize that concept art was like industry standard, right? So costume was a little slow to kind of pick that up or slow to, on the pickup of that. Um, and so I think that that job, I mean, my drawings looked nothing like um, that job, the, that my drawings looked nothing like they do now. So I was at first, you know, doing like almost like fashion sketches or like, you know, like long drawn out figures. I was drawing on paper, scanning them in and then using, you know, the fabrics and the textures and stuff and doing it in Photoshop. Then eventually I moved from doing that process to drawing completely in Photoshop. And then on Man of Steel, that was the first job that I started using photographs in my work. So before that, I wasn't using like photos, you know, of like people and all of that. So I started kind of Frankensteining together bodies and doing that. And then um, as time progressed, I went into using 3D to do my figures and do that stuff. It's, so it's like, it's been a progression. Um, there's been a, a long progression. So you can see that the, that it's, you know, my work has changed. Um, but it's all based on, if I, if I could go back and tell myself, I, I did learn a lot, a whole lot from sitting next to Ryan and being able to watch him draw and paint. Um, and I would say, I wish I would have told myself to, to really even more so immerse myself in that process uh, faster. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's been amazing to have you. And um, I, we, we probably could have a asked a few more questions, but I, I really want to be um, sensitive to your time and your schedule. We're a few minutes over from what we agreed to. So. Completely fine. Did anybody else have any pressing questions that they wanted to ask? Well, there are a couple in the Q&A area. Do you have a, a little have time? time. Yeah, it's okay. Um, uh, let's see what we got here. Let me go ahead and get the Q&A. Um, oh, <laughs> does, your family ever, does, your, does your family ever ask you when they're in the cinema, did you do that one? <laughs> oh, oh, all the time, all the time. <laughs> Or, or at this point now, because I've worked on so many things, people just assume, like, they're like, I bet Phil worked on that. And it's just always funny to me, because it's like, it, um, I do work on a lot of things. And I ultimately, I don't, um, because it's work, and I don't mean this in a bad way, it's just because it's work, I don't um, oftentimes even remember, like, because, because oftentimes, um, the movies you work on come out a year later. So if you imagine, like, say we're in January, right? I start a job in January. I'll probably be done with it by like February or March, right? So I finish that movie, then I move to another one. And then I continue that process throughout the whole year. Well, movies take about a year to come out. So I work on something, it doesn't come out until the next year, sometimes two years. Like Man of Steel, I worked on it, it didn't come out for two years. So, and I don't see everything. I see some stuff being made, um, more so now. But, but, you know, oftentimes, by the time I'm finished drawing, that's when they start making stuff or a lot of stuff. And I've already moved on to something else. So I really am kind of surprised or like a trailer will come out for a movie and I'm just as excited as you guys. Like, oh, that's great. And I'm like, oh, I worked on that. Like, I don't even remember. <laughs> like, so it's a kind of, it's an interesting process. Where I'm like, oh, that's how that turned out. You know, like, so it's kind of a surprise. Um, uh, for me as well. All right. Um, we got a couple more. Paul <laughs> Kelly asked this question. Um, and he says, what was one of the biggest turning points for you in terms of a game changer trick, technique, or even mind frame uh, or mindset that had a lasting impact on you since uh, and something that you use all the time now, like that thing that you do all the time to do the, get the work done? What's, what's that for you? Um, geez, there's so many. Um, mind frame wise, I would say listening to costume designers teach me little subtle things about costume, like paying attention to details, like, you know, where the seams are in your clothes. Cause we just all just put on clothes, we buy clothes, but you're not paying attention to how things are made. Um, 
So I'd say uh, I remember on uh, Star Trek, I learned a couple of things with Michael Kaplan. One of the things was uh, Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock, um, he uh, was at the time, he's older, obviously before he passed away, older and he's tall, but he slouches a little bit. So when you look at him from the side, he's kind of hunched over. Not too bad, but he's an older man, you know? Um, and so one of the things that I saw was in his costume, they, uh, they built the seams, this seam up here, this shoulder seam, this one, they built the costume seams back further. So when you looked at him from the front, it looked like he was standing up straight. Like it was, it was little things like that, or, and I'd be like amazed by them, or um, the fact that um, also on Star Trek, if you watch the first one where uh, you see Spock's mom, I think it was, uh, Winona Ryder, right? So she plays his mom. So all of the Vulcan women have this sculpt sculptural little shelf built into their chest area that makes, uh, it's, it basically kind of makes them feel more like, so like uh, more shapely. But Michael told me that, um, you know, and throughout history, if you look at, at clothing, right? For, especially for women, there's always a shift in like what they want to accentuate. So it's like, if you look at Victorian stuff, it's like the bustle. So it's like the hips or the butt or the, the shape of clothing changes to accentuate stuff. So he built this little shelf for every Vulcan woman because he wanted to, he said for them, their intellect is key. So longer necks were uh, aesthetically pleasing to, to, to Vulcaners or Vulcan men, right? They liked the, the longer neck lady. So it was things like that. It's the subtle things when you start thinking about conceptualizing costumes, like why do people wear things, what shape they are, um, that helped. And then process wise, I'd probably say the switch for me for using Daz or using posing was uh, a game changer for me because it allowed me more freedom to start with the costume faster. Um, I've done actually a good, a good frame of reference. I wish I had it completely piled together because I'd show you is showing all the Madonna tours I've done. I've done three with her and each one you can see my process has changed. So when I first was doing it, I was doing just pencil sketches mixed in with a little watercolor and then some computer. The second tour that I did was uh, more, it was like completely Photoshop almost with pictures. And then the third tour, the last one that I did with her before this most recent one was almost all dads. And the reason I started using dads was because I have to draw her and all of her dancers and I'm the only illustrator with the costume designer, Ariane Phillips. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to do that process and that it would be brutal unless I could speed up being able to pose. So the greatest thing about that is I could go watch dance rehearsal and I could see the poses the dancers were gonna do and I'd draw in my sketchbook and then I'd go back and I could pose the figures, light them and then immediately start drawing. So that's probably one of the key things for me was getting more into 3D, more control. That's great. This is awesome. I, I've learned a ton just from you personally as an artist to an artist. So thank you for sharing the information that you have uh, done. I mean, you've been more than generous with your time with us. Uh, so we are super, super grateful. I just want to thank you on behalf of the CG Society and CGMA, um, myself and Manny, uh, just to thank Phil Boutet Jr. You got to say it all, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just you can't say it without that. And I just want to thank you for this amazing hour plus of time that you shared with us about your background, your workflow. I'm just starting to get to know you. I know the people um, in the audience, uh, the attendees that came were just thrilled. A lot of the chats were really excited about what you were saying. Uh, your real fountain of uh, knowledge and experience. And, um, you know, it's also great to see where we've come from uh, in the industry uh, on all the points that you shared earlier.